Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Bettina. Just want to welcome you all to Artist Books and Cookies. Uh, before Adriana uh, tells you a little bit about Alumnos, I just wanted to say how honored we are by all of the incredible creativity and participation um, by the artists um, who've shared their books with us. And we're most grateful to our collaborators here at Ooga Booga and Mission Road, Ethan especially, um, and Wendy, and Jen, and Megan. So thank you, everyone. And always thank you to For Your Arts, Sarah and Alex. You guys are the best. Um, and we're so excited to have everyone from Alumnos in town. So this is Adriana, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. I'm so happy to be here. This is our first edition of uh, Artist Books and Cookies that we've done with uh, Bettina for your art, and now the second time that we do it here at Uba Uga Buga. Uh, my name is Adriana Maurer. I'm the director of uh, Alumnos 47. It's a nonprofit. And we work uh, to gather people and to exchange ideas, debate, and to try to learn with, with around contemporary art. So our program mainly is uh, through a, um, informal education and research um, about different problematic issues that we live every day in our life, city, Mexico, world. Um, I wanted to talk to you about why we end up here and do this event because the foundation, uh, Moises Cosio is the founder of the foundation. He started to, to collect contemporary art a few years ago. And when he went to research in some of our library in Mexico City, he didn't found a very common um, book that he was looking for. And he came up with the idea of, of doing and building a, a public library, uh, free access in Mexico around contemporary art books. So we start this and we start working around the, the, the main project. We now um, are working with um, an architect, uh, um, French Portuguese architect Didier Faustino that he's going to build this cultural space in Mexico City that we uh, will have the library and also all the content that we work with. We do a curatorial program. We have a mobile uh, library. We do uh, educational programs. And because of this idea of the books that we have been all the time uh, working around, our projects normally end up in a small, publication, uh, we start to build a um, collection around uh, artist books, a public collection. So this is when we start realizing that these kind of events make total sense for us because we share, we interact with different people from different parts of the world that make sense to our work and we keep like this dialogue open for future collaborations, acquisitions for our, our collection, uh, and also um, to build this contemporary art library. We've been around, we want to, at the end, the foundation, what site it's to um, democratize the access to art and culture that in our country, Mexico, is not that easy to, and it's not that open as we would love to. Um, what else should I tell you? Uh, we want uh, this event and these talks to go through like different minds, ideas, because for us it's very important, the interaction and, and to exchange, we love the books and we are so happy to have nearly 200 uh, submissions of these books. And I think that's, that's all. And thank you. <laughs> Hello. Wow, guys.
guys. Thanks for coming out today. Uh, I'm Andrew Berardini, and this is Sarah Williams, and we're the founders of the Art Book Review. Here, I'll talk into the microphone a little bit. Uh, we founded the Art Book Review like maybe a little over a year, year almost two years, almost ago, two now. years ago now. <laughs> and uh, we f we found it under a few different premises. One of them is that we are obsessed with books. We lust after them. We desire them. We want to handle them. We want them on our shelves, peeking back at us. And uh, we also wanted to create a bigger conversation around art books, which is a very loose premise for both of us, which includes everything from artist books to catalogs to uh, Marcel Brutter's um, Plaster of Paris of his uh, unsold poetry books. Anything that could be considered a book falls under our rubric, more or less. Also, we wanted to find a way to get really expensive art books into the hands of artists which is one thing that we do. And uh, the publishers, they send us books, and we trade them for with mostly young artists, but people of all different stripes and varieties, dancers and writers and whoever else is interested, to for, you know, short, you know, preferably experimental, but uh, always lovingly wrought reviews. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Today we have three... Um amazing writers, artists, publishers here to talk to us about one of their favorite artist books or one that's been particularly influential to their practice. Um, so first we're going to have Nikki Darling, um, who's a regular contributor to the Art Book Review. Um, and then we'll have Brian Kennan and then Monica Majoli. And so I'll just give a little, a little introduction to Nikki. Um, Nikki Darling is a student in the Creative Writing and Literature PhD program at USC. Her poetry and experimental essays center around subjectivity, persona, and post-structuralist methods of deconstructing literary form and meaning. She is finishing her first novel, Fade Into You, a memoir of mixed race identity in the San Gabriel Valley during the 1990s. Her criticism has appeared in the Los Angeles Times, LA Weekly, the Art Book Review, uh, Tomorrow Magazine, and Public Books, among others. Her, ap her essay, Appetite for Destruction, was included in the best music writing in 2010. And here's Nikki. Hi, I'm Nikki. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, so what's playing behind me is um, the wild one, and it's going to be playing there throughout the talk. So, I, um, so when Sarah asked me to do this, I was like, what a wonderful opportunity to talk about a book that has been really influential. And as a writer, um, I have so many of those books. But um, I do a lot of, uh, I guess for lack of a better word, like interdisciplinary creative art writing making and um, but I haven't always traditionally thought of myself as that type of person so I didn't have um, quote unquote an art book um, but then I realized I did have an art book and that the art books I had actually influenced a lot of how I think and create and the theory that um, and most importantly like uh, humanistic philosophy that that fuels my practice. So I wanted to come in and talk about um, Brando's Songs My Mother Taught Me and Peter Manso's, um, so this is an autobiography written by Marlon Brando in 1994. And this is an autobiography written about Marlon Brando in 1994. Each were released within uh, a month of one another. And it was a big deal. And um, also just give me like a little time thing because I'll just keep talking until the sun goes down. Um, so uh, the thing about these books, oh, and they were also released, this is neither really here nor there, but it created an air of excitement at the time when they came out. Um, they, they were released, 
during the trial of Marlon Brando's son, Christian Brando, who was on trial for murdering his stepsister's husband. Um, so the thing that I really loved about these books was prior to their arrival in my life, I had discovered Marlon Brando probably two years prior in uh, what would have been junior high. No, like a year. And I, had, I, I don't, I'm not sure how I saw my first Marlon Brando film, but I really identified strongly with it. And this is before the internet, so I'm 34. So at the time, the only access I had to know more about Marlon Brando were the, were the fan books that kind of looked like this at the library. And um, the thing with a book like this that came out in 1973 is that like when it came out, like he was still relatively fresh in the collective consciousness. He had been in like um, Last Tango in Paris, and he was making sort of a comeback um, in The Godfather. And so when this book was written, it was written with the idea that he was still very much a myth in the minds of people. But when I arrived at Marlon Brando in the 90s, not so many people were talking about him. He wasn't like, he was doing like The Island of Dr. Moreau. So the things I had to tell me about his life or to find out about who he was were very much limited to books like this that came out in the 70s when he was still really a big deal. So the great thing I learned about, or the great thing that happened to me when I got these books um, for my, what would have been my 13th Christmas, was that after reading them, I knew Marlon Brando even less. <laughs> because this book is a book written about Marlon Brando by Marlon Brando, and this is a book written about Marlon Brando. And um, I realized that I knew nothing about the man, because you can't really know someone through language. You have to know someone through knowing. And what I did know was more about the writers. I knew immediately the type of person that Marlon Brando wanted me to think he was, and I knew immediately the type of person that the writer wanted Marlon Brando to be. But Marlon Brando himself was a mystery. So I had these two narratives that were completely divergent, yet telling the same story about the same man. And um, the thing that opened my mind in this new way was that narrative sometimes means more than the reality. Like the reality of Marlon Brando was less important than the idea that he existed in our collective consciousness. And I don't know if you guys know about this guy named um, Edward Bernays, he was Freud's nephew. There's this really good documentary on like this whole movement with advertising that he um, spearheaded. It's called The Century of Self. I won't, it's by Adam Curtis. I won't talk about it too much, but if you're interested in that, that's a really good way to kind of get like a Cliff Notes version of contemporary uh, desire. And one of his ideas was that one of the ways to collectively control a great mass of people in a modern city or society is to tell them subconsciously what they should desire. And one of the ways that they found you could do that was through archetypes. We all invest in archetypes. Whether we um, are aware of it or not, we have an unconscious psychic agreement to certain things in the world. There's the tough guy, there's the rebel, there's the good girl, there's the slut, there's the virgin, there's the blah, blah, blah. And all of these things come together to create what is, for lack of a better word, um, a heteronormative cultural society in which certain things are desired and certain things are not desired. And you desire them through your access. So like, um, if you reach a certain level of cool, you know, you get to be a certain type of person who, within that space, can rebel against a society which is actually giving you the space to rebel. So Marlon Brando was actually not a rebel. He was an actor playing a rebel. And um, one of the great things Marlon Brando did also was cement this sort of contemporary myth that happened um, right, I'd say, around the birth of Coca-Cola and like the whole idea of the teenager as a thing. That was also like a really new concept. Like people, did, I mean, get a job, you know, give to your family, this kind of angsty thing. How am I on time? Okay, so I wanted to read this little tiny piece here from this Marlon Brando um, fan book that came out in 1973. And it's written by <laughs> Rene Jordan, which if you know anything about contemporary theory, is funny with, in itself that he started off as writing like these sort of. Anyway, a myth is born. In August 1950, during the premiere engagement of The Men at New York's Radio City Music Hall, Marlon Brando first scowled from the huge screen at a stunted movie audience. He slurred his speech and stretched his silences in an ecstasy of non-communication. 
He lay low like a sated tiger, ready to pounce again at the slightest hunger pain. There was something animal, primal, activist about him, and, every, and everyone responded in identification, revulsion, or alarm. Out of such fears and longings, stars are created and myths are born. Brando was both from the very first close up. He became the substance of endless dreams, the escape valve for myriad repressions. His style was cannibalized and badly digested by countless imitators, but far more important, it spilled into everyday life. He permeated America and was seeped abroad through a movie sieve. The world at large became his gallery of mirrors. So I like that chunk because what Marlon Brando projected out into the world ultimately was reflected back at him and the changes he was making in the cultural identity around teenhood, rebellion, people started buying these little boots. A really great example of this is Scorpio Rising by Kenneth Anger, which was a direct response to this whole moment of like homoerotic um, undertones within the narrative that aren't being discussed but existed, existed despite because well, I didn't come to talk about that movie, but one of the things that's really wonderful about that movie is that it has a really great way of contextualizing breaking down what we're being told to desire but not being told to desire. You know, so often um, contemporary advertising says, this is the thing you want, but they actually want you to want this other thing. And through telling you to want this thing, they make the other thing more attractive. And so um, Kenneth Anger is just really brilliant at being like, no, you don't want this. They want you to want that, and it's okay to want that. Like. This is actually about this guy's ass, and that's all right. Like, he looks good in these pants. That's you know why the director put him in them. But um, so what ends up happening is when these um, myths or personas or public personas are adopted by these actors. The other thing I liked is there really. Is, I mean, that's not a natural way to embody identity. I mean, that's like a very unhealthy way. Fame. So many books on fame. I'll never write one. Maybe I will. But. Um, one of the things I loved about this book is I could see the total and utter like break that this man had with his own self coming from the anxiety of stress of a public that was projecting an idea of who he was supposed to be onto him. So um, the man that wrote this book in accordance with Robert Lindsay, who's really just an editor that got paid to put his name on the book. I mean, he wrote the book with Marlon. But, um, what I got was that this was a man who felt very much like a victim. He felt very much like um, he was this like sad, beautiful, brilliant man that never got to be, you know? And then in this book here, oh, and that all the lessons of life can come down to the songs his mother taught him, which is, I don't know, well, I mean, I'm not Marlon, but <laughs> um, if like all I had were the songs my mom taught me, I'd be fucked. But, um, so Peter Manso's book was really great because Peter Manso was obviously so hungry to like destabilize this myth. Like he was like, no, he's a fucked up guy. And oh, there's this whole chapter about how he's like bisexual. This is 1994. Like, like somehow that's like gonna like fire the flames of like anti-Brandoism. And isn't he such a weirdo? He sent that Native American woman on the stage to get his Oscar. And it was um, really, really great to read these different versions of this man's life. And um, on top, oh, back here, you, I'm just playing. He's, guy, he's like so fucking gorgeous. <laughs> he's like beautiful. And um, how am I? OK, so I'm going to, I guess then, um, I don't know if anything I said just made sense. But I'm, uh, do I have time to read like two more pages? OK, so I'm going to keep reading this. And I'll leave you guys with this really beautiful opening. Oh, I guess my conclusion is, the thing I learned as a writer is that narrative, ultimately, the thing you learn most when reading a profile about someone is about the idea of the person that the writer has, and that the writer's power is really more insidious than I think we are allowed to think. Um, I write profiles, and I definitely think of them as little pieces of fiction, <laughs> you know, because um, language on a very Lacanian level means that we've made a break from the real, and the real is, is simply like a nonverbal state in which we inhabit our true selves, and those true selves are before we have language. You know, you can, I want boob, I want sleep, I want whatever. So to know someone through words 
is in fact impossible. You can only know someone from being with someone, and none of us have been with Marlon Brando, so what we're left with is the idea of this myth, which itself feeds a cultural narrative of consumption and convenient identity that I think is really sexy. Okay, so I'll just, um, I'll read this last little section. He became the substance of, oh, uh, the Brando image dies hard and survives in every boy or even girl who feigns indifference to hide alienation, risks spiritual frostbite to keep his cool, and erases every distinction of age, class, or even gender by indiscriminately calling everyone man. Beats, hippies, yippies, cats. The record changes, but they are all still in Brando's groove, even though their acquaintance with the wild early Brando may go no further than the late, late, late show. Yet however blurry the Xerox copies may be getting, Brando was first the original. He was the first method actor to become a movie star. Girls were swooning over his sullen masculinity while he was being proclaimed the world's greatest performer. Attempting to define the phenomenon, a Hollywood wag lamented, I'm afraid we have a genius for a matinee idol. idol. Oh, yeah, he was really broody. He was like, well, I'm thinking about things. Um, Brando was neither, but he was, in strong, but he was strong enough to survive being called the Valentino of the Bop generation, the walking hormone factory, and the male garbo. Oh, one of the other things that's really interesting to me about him is he's always been compared to female actors and sort of feminized in his um, emotionality because his thing was that he was emotional. And so this like uh, desire to feminize Brando, both through objectifying his body and his face, but then also like, um, and by feminize I mean like um, a contemporary heteronormative definition. I'm not, I'm not really talking about like the actual, I mean, what is femininity? Who the hell knows? Um, Beyond all the name calling, he was the method actor. The tag proved a blessing and a curse. In a consumer society, Brando became a standard brand with a label. He could be identified instantly on the cluttered Hollywood shelves to be discussed by obsolescence as soon as the fashion waned. But his magic lingered on. In two decades and 27 movies later, one wonders what his method was or if it was even really a method to begin with. Thank you. Next up, we have Brian Kennan. Uh, Brian is an artist based in Los Angeles and the editor and publisher of Second Canons. His work has been exhibited throughout the US and Europe. Initiated in 2005, Second Canons has published books with Meg Cranston, Bruce Hanley, Darren Bader, William E. Jones, and Bob Nikas, among others. In 2014, Second Canons opened a new project space in Los Angeles, where there are neighbors there. <laughs> Here's Brian. Um, yeah, hopefully you don't mind the announcement, but since it seems to be pertinent, uh, right now in the second can space, which is in Francois Gabali's building, uh, along with the Art Book Review, uh, we have a, a show of uh, Bookworks, which is a great uh, uh, UK-based publisher, been around for 30 years. Um, so, it, like I said, it might be of interest to you guys, so please check it out if it is. Um, so today what I did, I, I brought this a book which was actually quite significant to me getting into artist books, or particularly the books I got into. Uh, it's a book called Monochrome Paintings by Stephen Prina. It's somewhat a catalog and somewhat uh, an artist book. Um, I won't pass it around because I looked it up on Book, on book Finder before I came here, and <laughs> it's not that kind of book anymore, which is too bad, um, but I still have a copy. Um, but it's a conceptual, so I, I think the description will do fine. And, and what Prina did, and this really actually had a massive influence because I think I misunderstood it, uh, which is on some level one of the things I really appreciate about books. Which I'll get into that later. Um, but what it is, it's, a, it's an exhibition called Monochrome Painting Prina did in somewhere in the 90s, I can't remember when. Uh, but what he did is basing sizes on a history of monochrome painting, uh, different artists who did monochrome painting and the size they worked within. He went and to made those size canvases, took it to a, a car painter and had them all painted this particular green. Um, and then this is the catalog that went along with that. And in that, what he did is he just has the green color of the paper. And then replacing the, the paintings are these little tipped in, right? They're just gl little glued in things um, that 
are the, supposedly the, the, the paintings themselves, but they're just obviously uh, black ink squares with, on white paper. But again, this, this, that's all based on the size of those original you know, paintings he chose, which were like uh, Malevich, Rochengo, uh, Newman, Rauschenberg, Kelly, so far and so on. So when I, when I got this book, it was kind of just as I was kind of getting into art. I think at this point I'd done some artist books, like the very first rounds, which were really bad ripoffs of Ed Ruscha book, artist books. Um, but then this kind of opened up a new space for me. But I got it, I remember I went to MoCA and got this at the bookshop. I don't remember what uh, the, the show I was, oh, show I saw there was, but I do remember this book, um, which says something. Um, but, um, and then this is actually how I kind of became introduced to Prina. It led to me to going to Art Center to study with them. So in other words, it's probably the most expensive book I've ever bought. Um, <laughs> being that it was $60,000 and $20, but, um, and, um, but what it did really introduce me is this idea of the artist catalog as a space to make artist books. And if you know my work at all, that's kind of the whole core of it. Uh, so that was this introduction. Um, and yeah, and, and like I said, when, when I found this, there's really no essay in it, there's nothing explaining it, so I just was kind of received this book. And um, I didn't know the larger thing. Later, when I, when I studied with Prina, he explained it to me. And then much later, I think they represented the show in Basel, so I got to see the paintings. But when I saw this, I thought this was the entire thing. And I thought it was great, and I didn't understand it. Um, and I was, that's something I've always kind of appreciated about artist books, is um, you know, particularly when I kind of got into art, I was always resistant to uh, museum, gallery, presentations of art, because they were always so controlled. And what I like about books is that you could, they, they kind of circulate in a different system where they can be misunderstood or exist outside of the context of what a curator says or a gallerist says. Um, or a museum says. There's no wall text next to the books. Um, and also books, when they kind of go into your bookshelf, they can be next to who knows what. Like, it can make absolutely no sense, except to the person who puts it together, which of course then makes its own relationships and its own kind of theory of, of things. Um, so yeah, so I think for this book, um, like I said, my misunderstanding of it was really the key thing, and it's something that I really find always appreciated about books that are like kind of so possible. Um, I feel that might have been brief, but I, I think I'm done. Um, any questions, Andrew? Okay. Yeah. So, all right. Thanks. So next we have Monica Majoli, um, and Monica's practice examines the relationship between physicality and consciousness as expressed through the documentary Sexual Image. She has had, has had numerous solo exhibitions in Paris, New York, and Los Angeles, and her paintings were featured in the 2006 Whitney Biennial and also included in the 2006 Berlin Biennial of Contemporary Art at the KW Institute of Contemporary Art. Her work is represented in the permanent collection of MoMA, um, the Whitney, the Hammer Museum, the Getty Research Institute, um, MOCA here in LA, and uh, SF MOMA. Uh, Majoli, Majoli lives and works in Los Angeles and is a professor of art at the University of California, Irvine. Here should we. I'm, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the recent publications of Violet Spock or, or in honor of various survey exhibitions that have taken place over the last, um, I guess, about six or so years. Um, maybe you, pr you probably maybe know something about Liz Bacher. She was bas she's basically, well, she's about 70 years old now. Um, and for about 40 years, or maybe I should say around 30, 35 years or so, she was more of a legendary sort of underground cult figure. And in the past, uh, really, I would say through 
due to a show, a, a survey show at PS1. Uh, her work is now becoming much more widely uh, known. Um, and so I, uh, I've been friends with Lutz for over 20 years, and, um, but unfortunately, it's, it's difficult to talk about her work. Her work is hard to place, which I think is one of the reasons why uh, it took a while. I mean, it, hard to place and also hard to talk about and sort of out of the realm of language in a certain way. And I think that's part of why it's been rather difficult for her, in a sense, to kind of, uh, well, at least to be written about, I think, in any sort of substantial way. I think the only writer that took Litz on was Liz Coates in, in the early 90s uh, for a long time. So I actually uh, wrote something myself just so that I could kind of um, organize my thoughts about her work. Um, so I'll just, I think I'll just read it to you. Sorry, but I don't normally do this, but I felt it necessary. Uh, now New York-based, formerly Berkeley-based artist Lutz Bacher has been making books for years. By the way, this is Lutz in her in her Berkeley home, and this is the way she has it. Um, <laughs> she has it um, organized in terms of the the uh, depiction uh, for the book. Um, she's in her Berkeley home in her sort of upstairs uh, bedroom that she where she used to have an archive, and so all of the objects really that all of the sort of the newspaper clippings and and photographs and her, images of her work and you know, various emails from friends. Everything is sort of in a kind of archive by year. Um, and so she's basically here sort of organizing, I guess, images uh, for her archive, but basically thinking about ways in which she's organizing her, her enterprise, basically. Okay. Um, a lifelong collector of scraps of newspaper, columns, questionnaires, Xerox interviews, handwritten journal entries, often detailing dreams personal photographs, anonymous photographs, emails to and from Lutz, works from over 40 years of her singular production, weave in and out of all three of the sizable volumes that the artist has produced from her first Smoke It's In Your Eyes 2008 to her most recent Snow, released this year. Given its similarity, Bacher's website, which she began in 2009, may be considered a book. Page after page is radically different, achieving the cumulative discontinuity that distinguishes her work. Her books, her books allow one to examine more slowly the structures of reverberation that she employs, a vast network of negativity or dark matter that oddly pivots into affirmation through gallows humor and truth is stranger than fiction parables. The detritus of popular culture gleaned from the ruins of secondhand warehouses is often the raw material of her most recent installations, as is clearly documented in the final section of Snow. Snow is her new book, which is really kind of a catalog resume. And it's also sort of an archaeological dig of sorts, um, but it, it really displays her um, kind of scavenging through these sort of prop houses and, and second house warehouses, which she's often gotten whole bodies of work from. Um, oh, I lost my place. Um, secondhand is the operative term in a practice that has utilized the Xerox as medium since 1989. The pseudonym Litzbacher is itself one of the one or two steps removed from fact, a method of disguise, a masking of gender that provided unsettling neutrality, one that dislocates the personal voice. In the artist's books, obscurity, secrecy, and surrogacy are reoccurring themes. In the catalog Resonate Snow, she makes chronological order of a practice that swung purposefully across subjects and delivery to achieve unknowability. This throwing the viewer, the interviewee, thinking of the viewer as an interviewee. Off balance is a primary mode of Bacher's attack, hovering outside the verbal, dwelling squarely in the psychological. Her constellations might originate in Dada and be an extension of the ready-made, but the patina brought on by human handling and juxtapositions of narrative propose a crisis of meaning, a rupture. Her messages are felt through the body more astutely than the mind. While the mind grasps for clues to meaning, the body decodes messages instinctively. Through the book's recirculation of subjects, they're extremely repetitive works, by the way. Um, they're really actually, like, like her work in general, requires a great deal of commitment um, and focus to unpack what's going on often. And one, one can't ever really uh, be sure that they've unpacked correct meanings. It's, it's very much a kind of associate, free association. 
um, through the book's recirculation of subjects and experiments and reproduction via the Xerox. Bacher fashions a collective memory, perhaps created to stymie the function of reading, which is to understand. She confronts her reader with the paradox of holding but not having a key to the content of the book's material. The incessant return of stories of particular works shown differently with, it, with each iteration, particularly in Smoke and Do You Love Me, in acts of familiar, almost traumatic reliving of events or flashbacks. So I'm just going to now show you, um, kind of go through first Smoke Gets in Your Eyes um, a little bit with just a few passages. I mean, these are quite um, complex books. And I would say that Smoke Gets in Your Eyes is an artist's book. Um, it was made for the exhibition, or for two exhibitions, but it was made for the exhibition at PS1. But it's so, I mean, I don't think there are any, there's no writing in this book. There are no essays. It's really a kind of compilation of her work through from the 70s up until that point, which was, I believe, in 2008. Um, and just the way she's working with repetitive, and each of the books are extremely repetitive in terms of imagery. She'll, re, she'll sort of refine or, or, as I said, restate an image or a body of work through images that just kind of keep popping up. Um, but Mother Always Was was a very early piece that she did. I remember it actually being shown um, in the early 90s in a kind of filing cabinet so that you would, you would pull out you know, drawers and there were different things on the drawers and they were all printed, excuse me, different t-shirts in those drawers and they all had a different um, sort of message um, or statement or the beginning of a statement. Her work is, is very fragmentary um, and that's, that's sort of an aspect of, of this, this uh, sort of unanswer unanswerable questions that she poses. Um, so I'm just going to follow a passage. So basically, mother always was. Then it starts up again, a few, a number of pages later, with with a questionnaire that ends up revealing where that where that quote came from, which was from this this personal history questionnaire, which is obviously something both about mental health and physical health. And she's also answering questions here very sporadically. Um, and she's and she's pairing these things with different, like I said, sort of different bodies of work. Um, in this case, the jokes proceeded with Jane Fonda. Um, she always worked from the found material, sometimes material that I remember in the early 90s was very difficult for people to kind of understand because um, she never, it was never really sort of stated what her perspective was. So a number of pieces she did w were about sexuality at this, at this point in time, around the 90s, late, excuse me, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and she worked with this material and then basically kind of presented it in this very um, neutral way. And, and so people were often quite confused and maybe kind of upset by uh, her lack of position, the lack of her, in a, her desire not to take a position. Um, so she's played with this idea of a kind of, um, uh, I guess a neutral field, almost so that I think that it essentially uh, Throws, throws light really more on the content of what she's working with rather than on herself or her position or assumptions that are being made based on her gender, her age, etc. <laughs> Palpitations. What does it say? <coughs> Possibly. Um, so also another thing, oh, this, this is a funny one, um, in this little clipping, uh, this newspaper clipping, um, it's a, it's, some, it's a man talking about washing his fiance's, or no, massaging his fiance and wanting and having the desire to strangle her um, at, the, at the same time. And so there was this, this sort of reoccurring aspect of a kind of the perversities or the marginal, uh, the marginality of, of certain sexualities that she was really interested in um, bringing forward. Um, this work, Kip, was actually the, the prototype for a series of works that she did where she printed uh, men's sexual fantasies onto mirrors. And in this particular um, excerpt from that body of work, um, it's, the, it's, the, it's, this, it's, it's basically this man talking about wanting to ejaculate onto mirrors, and I think he finishes it off by talking about the ultimate, um, the ultimate place to do that would be the White House. So there's this kind of, 
right. Oh, no, it hasn't gone back to, you know. So essentially, we're just, I'm just taking you directly through the book at this point to sort of show you how she's organizing um, the material. So finally, we see Mother Always Was at the, at the top line there. So in ways in which she's sort of picking up s threads or strands of, of, um, of material content and then sort of locating it later on in the book. So if you have the dedication uh, to really read closely, you'll see how the book is organized, um, essentially, the structure, the psychological structure of the book. At the same time, she has things like uh, a three-page letter that was written to her by Marlene McCarthy, uh, the artist, and she pairs it with um, an ex, a, a, a book, uh, I think this was like the, uh, from Film Quarterly. Um, it's an, it's, it's a basically reproduction of an article about Monica Truitt's uh, film about a dominatrix. I don't remember her last name, but her first name was Ava. Um, basically, Ava was the person being described in a film, in a, in a video that Lutz did, that involved a young woman uh, who's an artist. So um, basically, uh, so I, I suppose that you can, you wouldn't, obviously if you hadn't seen the film and you didn't know the personal story behind here, obviously you would be left a little bit in the lurch. So there's this kind of interesting way in which they're sort of open, you have to be in a sense in the know to really appreciate the material, I think. Um, I think, unless you know the, the, the film that, or the video, excuse me, that Marlene is referencing, uh, and then you would be able to put together that this older woman was this dominatrix Eva. Eva. Um, immediately goes into this very abstract sort of um, censorship uh, here, paired with, again, with, with a kind of scientific um, breaking down or diagram of, of a kind of you know, the states of various ages of people, et cetera, personalities, types, et cetera. Um, so she, she takes this position of being a kind of, I don't know, it's, it's like this very impersonal um, voice, but at the same time, there's this visceral quality that she's really actively stirring up, uh, both aesthetically and with the material that she's working with. Um, Also, her dreams are in the book. So there's this kind of, there, also, the work is really hilarious. So there's this other aspect. There's a kind of violence involved. There's a, a really a, a kind of um, um, caustic sense of humor. Uh, there's a great deal of absurdity that she's courting. Um, and it all sort of mixes together in this book. Here, uh, she's referencing a show that she had in San Francisco at ratio three, and this was, this was some kind of material that I think was reproduced in some kind of an art blog or some kind, and uh, this young man was talking about an encounter that he had with Lutz and actually with Vincent Fecto, who was there at the opening, and there is a, basically then Lutz sh uh, sort of reveals a, an email that was sent from uh, Vincent to, to Lutz about this event. <clears throat> And I think he was called a dude at that, at that event by this young person who was, um, and then again she shows the photograph that this young man took of them. Um, so for a long time, it's, it wasn't uncommon for Lutz to cover her face whenever anybody wanted to take, not anybody, but these kinds of public um, uh, events where her work was involved. Um, so there was this kind of way that, yeah, she was really courting this idea of anonymity and, um, uh, kind of playing humorously with not being exposed as an individual. Um, but in the book, Do You Love Me? Um, it gets more complicated and actually was very surprising to a lot of us because in this book she kind of moves from this enigmatic um, sort of mythology around her uh, and, and moves into very personal depictions of her home life, her private life, her relationship with her, you know, her relationship with her husband of 40 years, her, her, the fact that she was a mother, all of these things that really complicated this picture of her. Um, so there, and even as a child, I mean, she depicts herself here even as a child. So there's a sense that she's really revealing, um, while the interviews that she's that she's, uh, this is basically, I'm sorry, I didn't really tell you, this is a ba this is basically a book of interviews. Um, that I think she conducted maybe from the mid 
two, like 2006 to 2009, I believe. Um, so basically this Do You Love Me was originally a 12-hour video that she produced in, in 1994 and it was about these interviews basically that she was conducting with friends, curators, um, you know, artists, writers, um, about herself. So basically it was kind of about how we perceived Litz and it was a, it was a rather, um, like everything in, in her work, it's fragmentary, there's a kind of combative quality, there's a kind of sense that, that we were wrestling with her in terms of sort of parsing out uh, a version um, of reality. And so this book actually picks up where that video uh, sort of left off and was a more contemporary um, selection of people that were close to her at that time. So she's balancing this um, sort of her work and sort of showing images of her work at the same time that she's showing these very intimate sort of intimate sort of personal images of, of herself and her in her home life and her private life. And also in this work, um, she repeats uh, sh she she shows certain bodies of work over and over and over again. So. Um, like the Playboys, for instance, were shown multiple times. This piece that she called Big Boy, which was just sort of an anatomically correct, enormous um, stuffed um, cartoon man, um, was shown many times in, in many uh, sort of versions, uh, visual versions. And also this, this one um, piece that's called Huge Uterus, which she, I think, made in 1989, um, which was a six-hour video of uh, a surgery um, that was performed on her to remove some fibroid tumors. So she really combines these images of huge uterus with um, images of her as a mother. Um, so this was really a kind of surprising and extreme uh, uh, shift, uh, I think, that, that occurred here with this work. And I think that it was related to the sudden death of her husband who was an astronomer, a world-renowned astronomer, who died in, in 2009. Um, that's kind of how I interpreted this change. Um, so here she's really talking about obscurity and the fact that she was working in obscurity for many years. So she has a very particular, um, I would say her career has been really extraordinarily singular in the sense that um, you know, she's been working all of these years and really did have a following, but wasn't but the sort of way in which she really wasn't um, in, in a more sort of public or consciousness or in a certain kind of discourse um, was something that was really a part of the work itself in a sense. Here she is, here I was sort of basically showing you the different ways in which she's picturing playboys. Um, and that was just a few of those um, images. So she's, again, she's really working creatively with the idea of the Xerox, which she's done all along. And so that's how the book ends. Um, an image of her and her husband at, at the shore. Um, I wanted to show you this. When I told Litz that I was doing this, um, uh, she sent me this film that she had recently made of of the of her final book or the book as it's just released. Um, I'm trying to find. Sorry, I'm I'm not much of a technical. Uh oh, 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 oh. Wait, come back. Uh, come on. Sorry, can someone help me? <laughs> help me! Help me! <laughs> I'm just trying to start, I'm trying to start this thing. Um, this is a 15 minute film, but I'm only gonna show you about half of it. Um, there aren't really any children here. There's some, there's some sexual conversation and... Um, Not really. Uh, um, she's complicated. She's very complicated. She she's not Marilyn, but she's also not Bella. She has her own... Um, Oh, she's she, in a she, totally different... I mean, that's the class question. Oh. She's definitely not Marilyn, and she's definitely not No, Marilyn, Marilyn cuckolded her, presumably, or at least theoretically. 
It's complicated. It's complicated, as we know. Mother always was. Oh. Well, it's no wonder that this is the book. This is very... It's a, is it very illuminating? Don't you think? Sequence? I mean, I know I've seen this a hundred times, Well, it gets better in time. Don't I think? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. What are you thinking? I did it. I know. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you did it. What have I done? I, um... Uh, it's just following along. Right. Just following along. Thanks. With whatever appears. Right. In the just reading universe. the signs. And it just does seem to unfold. It does indeed. And there are tables and chairs. The Sylvia, these are on these tables. Right. And I have those tables and chairs. And they're based on these child table and two chairs that we have uh -huh. as children, yes. But there are, you know, more of a, an adult size. Mm -hmm. My beliefs are made out of poplar, and I think that's the same wood that Tamara's been using in the uh -huh. and so on. Got it. So that's that interesting. has actually returned. Yeah, there are also this un unfinished, I think that's poplar she's using. Who knows? Where are we? Oh. We're back at the Coxsackers. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the White House and the whole thing, right? This is the theory of that piece. Of which piece? Men, men in Love. Men in Love is the theory of? And then uh, Kip is the theory of Men in oh. Love because he's describing wanting to, he likes to put that on mirrors and oh, toilets. I and see. He's really the big so kahuna with the, the White House. He's the puck of Men in he's Love. He's the thesis piece. He's why that piece is printed on mirrors. Okay, I never knew that. See, this is good we're doing this. Then I move over to the mirror and watch myself as I come. Often I can't reach the mirrors with my cup, even though I'm six feet tall, so I come in my hand and smear it all over the mirror. What really turns me on is thinking about the next guy who walks in there and sees it and how he reacts. And then... And I like to do it in classy men's room, like in a big fancy hotel or in office buildings because it's all the more astonishing there. I don't like dirty jobs in, like in public parks and libraries and all. Christ, in there you'll find shit on the mirrors. I like messing up a clean place. If it's sparkling, I sometimes shoot my semen right through the air onto the mirror. I've always dreamed of doing it in a men's room at the White House. So. Comments, questions? <laughs> yeah. Pretty much says it all. Yeah, I think I know about that. Yeah. So, yes, that's the. So, all these things can be, many of these things can actually be represented in the modules. Yes, they can and should. Because this is a real template. <laughs> it is a real template for, for, for the situation that we find ourselves in. <laughs> Correct. That's right. That's a good one. This is revealing. This is so revealing. All we, need, we have a textbook. We have a textbook. <laughs> We've got our workbook. We've got our exercises. <laughs> uh, right. It's all kind of Revealed. Where are we? Well, we're at the way we were, which I've never seen. Oh. Well, that brings in the singing. Mm -hmm. Blue Moon, Elvis. Misty chocolate cover, Memories. Well, that's right. That was always what? Your, that was always Peter's idea about that song. What? Which one? The way we were. 
the chocolate covers. <laughs> Peter's <laughs> revision of that song. What is that? Oh, that's the menstrual insurrection kit. Right. Um, oh, no, no, it's pink. What is that one? This is Miss California. I don't know that oh. I've ever seen those. That's a beauty concept. Look at the intestines from Miss California. Mm -hmm. It's alright. And then mm -hmm. the beauty contest. <laughs> See, this is really... <laughs> it, it does, it is operating as a kind of textbook. It is. For us. For us. That's good, because we could tend to forget things. Lose our place, yeah. This is, it's all right here. So, this is the feminist movement. Then there's Are You Experienced? And there's Guitar Debris. Guitar debris. Which is good. Also related to cocksuckers in some way, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, the, the great thing about this book, really, is in its descriptions, which are usually very funny. And so there's, a, there's like, I mean, I'm sorry this was actually quite rushed in terms of its, I, I don't know if you were able to read any of the kind of funnier um, things that were said about this or the, the subtlety of the humor here. But um, one of the pages is blank, and the title is Wind. And basically it says, uh, let's see, sorry. The wind description reads, a blank white billboard with wind buffeting it from behind. So there's like ways in which, also maybe you notice too that the, these objects that, that she's working with as material here in this book, rather than showing them installed, she expects the, the reader or the viewer to kind of basically take her word for it that it is what it is going to become as art. And she's sort of just plainly kind of just putting out like, in other words, here's one called the light orb. And the description writes, a very large orb placed shaped light to descend from ceiling to floor. So this way in which, she t I feel like she's taking ready-made to a new uh, sort of new place with, with this sort of, um, uh, I don't know, almost a kind of speculative um, belief in the artist's ability to, to transfer, or to, to imbue objects, ordinary objects uh, with art, with the sort of the conditions of art. Okay, thank you. Thank you to Monica and Nikki and Brian. Um, in about an hour, we're going to have John Tain from the Getty, in, uh, Getty Research Institute in conversation with Lisa Ann Auerbach, and she'll be talking about her magazine, which is on view over here. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, check it out before the talk. Anyway.